So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Victor Stinner, and I'm going to present you Python 3 10 years later. So I'm a C Python core developer for eight years, but I'm contributing to Python for 10 years. Uh, currently, I'm working on a C Python on OpenStack for Red Hat, but I moved to a new team recently, so today I, I do maintain Python for Red Hat. And I'm a very happy user of Fedora on, on Vim. I decided to organize my, my talk in, three par uh, in four parts, the four seasons. So let's start with Autumn. So um, the start of Python, Python 3 was uh, a project called Python 3000. And uh, everything started with um, a PEP written in uh, 2006, the PEP 3000, uh, Python 3000. And uh, the, um, the thing is that at this time, more and more people started to complain about things called Python warts, which are design issue of Python 2. And um, some people started to, to write a list of all the warts. So the plan was to fix all of them, or most of them. To give you some example, in Python 2, you have two different types for integers. You have the lo long integer and small integer. And depending on the operation, depending on the input type, you may get a small or large or long integer. So if you would like to test the type of a variable to check if it's an integer, you, you have to check for both types. And if you are new in Python, it could be very surprising to, to have two different types for the same thing. And something else is that we added a new, uh, new class in uh, Python 2 during the development on Python 2 to, for example, add uh, properties. And the issue with the new class is that if you use new features like properties on all class, uh, it, didn't work, uh, it doesn't work as expected. And again, it's a little bit confusing that depending if you inherit from object or not, you get an old or, or, or new class. So the, the idea was to, to move to the new class and just remove the old one. For the, for the division, when you divide two integers in Python, you get an integer in Python 2. And when you are new to Python, or when you use a calculator, you expect that you get a floating point number. For example, divide one by, divide one by two, you get zero in Python 2. And it's maybe not the expected result. So we wanted to change that to always return a float, especially because in Python 2, you already have a dedicated operator, which is the integer division. Instead of a single slash, it's a double slash to always get an integer. For Unicode, um, a Unicode, I would say that if your application is using Unicode ev everywhere, like for inputs, for outputs, if all uh, the text is on proceed as in Unicode, everything is fine. If all your inputs are bytes, all the in output has bytes, uh, you have bytes everywhere, everything is fine. But if you have both uh, Unicode and bytes, uh, you will get a hard time because uh, it works uh, in most cases, but as soon as uh, you write a name with a non-ASCII character, like a letter with a diacritic in French, you get a new Unicode error, and it can be very uh, painful to fix all your application to make sure that you are using Unicode everywhere. So we also wanted to change that in Python 3. So the comparison in Python 2, uh, the idea is that the comparison never fails. So if you compare two, two numbers, uh, if you compare two objects, but uh, your Python is not able to compare the two objects, what Python does is to get the type, uh, the name of the type of the object. For example, you compare the number three to the string hello. You get the string int for integer and the string uh, str for the name of the type. On Python, decide to order this uh, object depending on these two strings. Uh, it's a little bit surprising and maybe not the behavior that you expected. So again, we don't want to change that. And last not, but not least, uh, in Python 2, uh, all imports are, um, are relative by default. So if you use uh, the same name that the module in the standard library, like the sys module or the OS module, uh, you may get the, your own code instead of the module from the standard library. 
So it can be it's very surprising, and you can get a lot of issues depending how you run your application. So again, we wanted to change that to use the import absolute by default. So to limit the risk, to not break everything, from the very beginning of Python, Python 3, uh, the idea was to only fix acknowledged words, to not fix everything, but very um, a short list of things. Uh, we also had a community process for, to decide what to change, uh, which means that we have um, a list of peps with numbers starting with 3,000. Um, and we did not want to re-implement the interpreter from scratch. Uh, the interpreter is a C Python, which is written in, in uh, the C language. And uh, if you write a new implementation, maybe uh, what you can get is to get a very subtle dif um, behavior changes between Python 2 and Python 3. And the, the, the idea was to limit the number of changes to really make sure that we get the best uh, backward compatibility. And from the very beginning of Python 2, uh, uh, Python 3, sorry, we already had a deadline for the end of life for Python 2 to, to warn all, our, all of all your users to make sure that uh, everybody's aware that we are moving on and it's time to move to the new Python. And finally, in 2008, <laughs> the holy grail, Python 3, we got it. And the first migration plan was very, very simple. Uh, Python 3 comes with an application called 2 to 3 to port your whole code base at once to Python 2, to, uh, from Python 2 to Python 3. And by doing that, uh, it's very easy because it's a single step and you're done. Uh, maybe if I'm still here to discuss about the migration from Python 2 to Python 3, maybe it didn't go as expected. Uh, because um, there are many reasons why it doesn't work uh, as smooth as expected. And uh, one of the issues is that uh, when Python 3 has been released on Linux, you didn't get Python 3 uh, from the first day. Uh, we had to wait one up to two years to get a Python 3 in, the, in Linux. So if you remove the Python 2 supports, uh, you, you drop uh, all your user base if your user base is um, in Linux. So for um, the maintainer of modules, uh, using 2 to 3 was a no-go because we just don't want to lose our users. Uh, another, uh, another issue with this migration plan is that um, when you have uh, 10 dependencies, if you have a single dependency which is not compatible with Python 3, you are stuck because uh, just for example, import the module raise a syntax error and you, you cannot continue to port the rest of the code because, uh, because you are blocked uh, very early in the migration. And the last point is that um, we didn't expect that, but uh, in fact, many people were using Python, Python 2 and we were not uh, aware that so many people uh, depend on the Python 2 and use it in production. Um, and something else is that um, is, is a thing called technical debt. So let's imagine that you are, you are a developer and you are discussing with your, your manager, and your manager asks, uh, "Why should I let you work on Python 3 support?" And the developer says, "For all these new cool Python 3 features, obviously." Okay, but can we use all these new features? And the developer. Well, uh, since we still have to support Python 2, nope. Uh, because um, the thing is that when you still support Python 2, uh, you, you, if you use a new features of Python 3, you get an import error or you get a syntax error or whatever else. So it means that uh, even if technically you support Python 3, you cannot use new features. So the migration um, has a cost because you have to spend time on the migration but there is no direct benefits. So when you discuss with a manager to explain the technical depth, um, it's very hard to convince, to convince your manager. To, to port your code, what you can do is to, um, is to divide your code in, a, in two different branches, in Git 
or Mercurial or whatever you want to have a run, one branch for Python 2 and one branch for Python 3. And uh, some project decided to, to be forked, to not have two, two different branches, but two, two different repositories. In some cases, the, um, the fork was made upstream, like the DNS Python project has been forked as DNS Python 3. Uh, sometimes um, the company be behind the project, like Pill, didn't, didn't care about Python 3 uh, because, because of the technical depth and because of the cost of the migration. So in that case, the community decided to fork the project and to, to actually do the migration. So the Peel project has been forked under a new name, which is Pillow. And not only you get the Python 3 support, but also new, new features. And sadly, uh, in some cases, um, the, the project like, for example, MySQL Python um, was no longer maintained. Um, and, and when I was working on uh, OpenStack to port OpenStack to Python 3, it was a blocker issue because uh, MySQL is very popular in OpenStack. And this, is, uh, this was the only driver to, to connect to, to the database. And since the, since the project was no longer maintained, it was very difficult to, to get any change merge in the official project. So some, one, one guy uh, decided to, to fork the project under a new name, MySQL Clients, to port uh, to Python 3 and again to add new features to fix bugs. Uh, but you got a new issue is that you don't know what is the official upstream because the, the old one is the official one but it's no longer maintained. And if you move to the new one, uh, you don't know if the old maintainer will maybe wake up one day and say that, oh, this is my project, you stole my project. It was a little bit difficult uh, in some cases. And when uh, Python 3 has been released, the stable version of Python 2 was still Python 2.6. And the issue with Python 2.6 is that um, it, it's, it has a lot of troubles to write a single code base for Python 2 and Python 3 in the same file because of the syntax, um, it didn't help to write a single code base. Um, for example, um, about the Unicode string, in Python 2, to get a Unicode string in literal, you have the U prefix. But if you use this U prefix in Python 3.0, you get a syntax error because we decided that it doesn't make sense in Python, two, Python 3 to have a prefix because by default everything is Unicode, so you don't have to add any prefix, it's obvious. Uh, but this was not a good choice be because uh, people really wanted to keep Python, Python 2 support. So it was very painful and uh, one solution was um, the six module, which has a U function, and when you call this function, depending if it is Python 2 or Python 3, you get a conversion, uh, like you decode the string to get Unicode on Python, Python 3. And then in Python 2, if you really wanted to get Python 3 features, like the new uh, Unicode, a uh, unit test, um, which has new methods to write new unit tests, you, you, can, you, you can use um, a backported version of the module and then it's a, it's a pain because you have to pull a dependency and um, it's more complicated than using something for the standard library. So after the, uh, after the autumn comes the call time of the winter time. <laughs> and to start the winter, uh, there is a, a website which has been created in 2011, which is called the Python Free Wall of Shame. And the purpose of the website was not really to blame um, maintainer. The, the, in, the intent was to motivate uh, package maintainer to move, to move on to Python 3. But when the website has been created, only 9% of the top 200 projects on PyPI were compatible with Python, Python 3. And to give you an idea of the status of the migration at the beginning, um, I identified three big, three big players in the Python community, which are Twisted, um, Mercurial, and Django. Twisted is a um, very powerful uh, framework to write network application, not only clients, but also servers. And Mercurial is something similar to, to Git. It's a source control management, and it's written fully in Python. 
The last one, Django, uh, maybe you already heard about it. It's a very uh, popular um, framework to write web application to, to, to have um, the database you're using an ORM, to, to have templating, to man manage users, to ma uh, generate the admin interface. So it's a very complete uh, framework, it's very popular, but when Python 3 has, uh, has been released, there, there were some troubles to port all these applications to Python 3. The issue with uh, Twisted and Hercule is that um, Twisted is working on the network layer. Uh, on, on the network, you cannot speak Unicode because you only have uh, wires, you have bytes, and to get, uh, to get Unicode there, you, um, I would say it's not the appropriate type to, to manage network. So the native type for Twisted is not Unicode but bytes, and Python 3 uh, makes it more difficult to use bytes. And for Mercury, it's the same thing, because not only for the file contents, but also for the file name, uh, they really wanted to use by bytes to get the best uh, compatibility with all operating systems. And because of that, they, um, it was a very long journey to them to be ported to Python 3. For example, Twisted uh, today is ported, but uh, Mercury is still a work in progress, 10 years later. And then Django, um, at the beginning, it supported uh, Unicode, but it was not um, perfect. There, there were many, many issues. So it took time to port uh, Django to Python, to Python 3. And because of all this issue that I started to describe, because of uh, the very slow migration, very, because of all these problems, uh, we started to see the French guy the, the Python 3 trolls, uh, we, we consider that hmm, maybe Python, Python 3 doesn't bring anything because as I explained, uh, when you use Python 3, you cannot use new features because you still have to, pass, to support Python 2. So uh, you have to spend a lot of time to, for the migration, but you, didn't, you don't get anything. So what's the point of Python 3? It's useless. And according to the trolls, uh, the migration to, uh, to Unicode uh, is just a pain point. It doesn't bring anything. Because if you use bytes in Python 2, you, don't, you never get any kind of error because of uh, Unicode error or Unicode encode error. Because bytes just, just works. Maybe if you use two different documents in two different encodings, you may get an error, but uh, not an error, but moji bake which means that you get strange letters in your text. But they say that, well, who cares? We, we all speak English. <laughs> so slowly, the trolls uh, come up with a new idea. They say, hmm, maybe, maybe people are still using Python 2. Maybe we should just continue the development on Python 2 and let the core developers do their thing on Python 3. And so they decided to create a Python 2.8, which is a Python 2.7 with new features. And um, the problem was that uh, even if some people were like, liked the, the ID, nobody was volunteered to do the actual work. And um, to give you an, uh, an idea of uh, this issue is that in 2014, so it's only four years ago, uh, there was still a, a debate about the transitional Python 2.8. And um, what was written in this article is that they are still concerned about uh, Python 3, which may never take off. And uh, Python 3 only represents under 2% of packages, according to the trials. But uh, what we did in 2011 is to write a PEP uh, the PEP 400, the PEP not found, which is uh, Python, Python 2.8 on release schedule. It's a document to explain that, no, we are not going to continue the development in Python, 3, Python 2. We, we have very good reason to move on, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a document to, to make it very obvious for everyone. And if you look at the numbers differently, in 2013, in fact, 80% of the most of the um, um, 50, 50 top, top project on PyPI were already compatible with Python 3. So it was not 2%, but 80, it's different. And in uh, 2014, um, at the PyCon US, uh, Guido Van Rossum gave a, um, a keynote, 
and he, he took a very, very good, um, wise uh, decision is that uh, he, we decided to extend the support of Python 2 by five years. It means that in, instead of having a, a usual support of five years, we get a very long support of 10 years. And the, the, the idea was to send a message to all our Python 2 users to say that, okay, we know that uh, you have good reason to not migrate right now. Uh, it took time to, to migrate the dependency, it took time to write new tools. We know that it's very painful. Uh, we, we will not break Python 2. Uh, for your information, today Python 2 still gets security fixes. It still gets bug fixes. It's, uh, you still get new release uh, at least once a year. So we, we still support Python 2. We don't force you to move uh, right now. There is no intent to break Python 2 on purpose. So the deadline is now in two years. So after the cold winter comes the fresh air of the spring with flowers and new plants, some, some new starts. And the good news is that we fixed our first issue in Python. Do you know what is the first issue in Python? Uh, the first issue was that uh, when you had to install a dependency, uh, the newcomer come on, on IRC, on a mailing list, and ask, how can I install a dependency? And the answer was, oh, just install setup tools. Okay, but how can I install setup tools? So you, you had to go to a specific website, download a Python script, install the Python script, and uh, maybe you need a system, um, system administrator permission to install the script. So it was very painful to, to explain how to install your first dependency. And the good news is that in uh, 2011, pip 1.0 has been released. And um, in Python 3.7.9 and Python 3.4, we added something uh, called ensure pip. So it's not pip itself, but uh, it is uh, the thing to bootstrap pip. It's, um, it's an installer of pip. So thanks to that, now you don't have to, to worry about how to install pip because it's already part of the language. You already have something to install pip for you. You don't have to, to take care of that. And because, because of um, onshore pip has been added to the standard library, quickly uh, pip became the de facto installer for Python. So because of that, um, today you don't have to, to ask how to install something. Everybody knows that it's pip. And uh, thanks to that, um, it's much, much more easier to install dependency, and it's also uh, much more easier to have, to have dependencies, because previously some people just didn't want to have dependency, and they decided to, to vendor some libraries to avoid any kind of dependency, and uh, out of that, you, you get some security issues, for example. And the last point is that uh, today, Linux distribution also comes with uh, pip. Okay, so previously I said that uh, maybe two to, two to three was not as a good approach for the migration because you just uh, lose uh, all your Python 2 users. So maybe we can do something differently is that uh, instead of uh, removing Python 2 support is to add the Python 3 support. And uh, said uh, like that, it seems very obvious uh, because people know today the, how to do that. Uh, but you have to understand that it took a lot of time to came up to this new approach uh, because it took a lot of time to understand that the old approach was wrong. It also take, took time to write the new uh, tools to do actually the migration. And um, there are very important modules like uh, six, for example. Six is very useful to write a single code base for Python 2 and Python 3. And uh, one example of this new approach is a modernized tool which takes your uh, Python 2 code base and adds Python 3 supports. I, um, and I also wrote a, a different tool which is called Sixer. Uh, this tool is written uh, for my very own use case, which is to port OpenStack to Python 3. Because in OpenStack, it's a, it's a giant project with uh, 2,000 developers, a lot of companies, uh, many, many things, uh, many changes are merged every day. So if you generate a giant patch, uh, you, you can be sure that in a few hours you will get a conflict. 
So I wrote a new tool to, to be able to modify only a few files uh, by doing a few specific operations. For example, using my tool, you can only add parentheses to the print statements to convert the statement to a, a function call because the function calls works on Python 2 and Python 3. And by doing that, uh, the, the main benefit is that instead of porting your code base at once, in fact, you can uh, do it step by step. And by, do it, by doing that, you can validate that at each step, uh, everything is fine. You can sh uh, run tests to check that there is no regression. Uh, and it's much easier to review these changes because they are much shorter. So thanks to this approach, uh, it was much more easier to port big applications. If you are, if you are a very big uh, company, maybe you get uh, other issues because your code page is really large. Uh, in this case, maybe you need a different uh, approach. For example, uh, for very old uh, legacy code, what you can do is to, um, to first add new tests because nobody wants to get regression just uh, because of Python 3. So the idea is that first you write tests to make sure that you don't regress. And uh, an, uh, an another approach tested by Dropbox is that um, they are working on type uh, hinting, type annotation. And uh, using the typing module, which is new in free Python 3.5, I think, you can uh, standardize the way to annotate the type for function parameters and for the result type. And by doing that, you can use a tool called MyPy, which is a static analyzer to make sure that you pass the correct type to, to a function. And by doing that, they expect that the migration to Python 3 would be much, much more easier. And um, to, to make the transition of, uh, easier, we have also made uh, changes in, um, in both sides of Python. For example, in Python 3.3, we reintroduced the euro prefix for string. And thanks to that, you can use a prefix in Python 2 and Python 3 to get a single code base with Unicode strings. In uh, 3.5, we added uh, the bytes uh, formatting operator, bytes percent args. This is very useful for Mercurial and Twisted because they, they manipulate a lot of bytes. And by, uh, the bytes operator is more efficient than taking bytes, converse to Unicode, and encode bytes back to bytes. And on the Python 2 side, what we did is also to add new warnings. Uh, the, the idea of warning is that you, you take your application, you enable the warning, and uh, once you get a warning, you know that, oh, maybe you should have a look at this part of the code, and uh, you can start to fix some, some issues uh, which are um, warnings about future uh, backward incompatible un changes. And um, again, to, to build bridges between the two versions, uh, more and more people backported Python 3 features from Python 3 to Python 2, which means that uh, actually you can, you can use Python 3 features. So for example, there is a unit test 2, but also enum 3.4, which is a new, new enum module of Python 3.4. And after spring comes the summertime. <laughs> if you recall the, the website called Python 3, Python 3 Wall of Shame. The author of the website changed the, uh, the title to Wall of Superpower. <laughs> yeah. And we moved from 9% to 95%. So it's almost 100%. Uh, but in practice, you have to know that we, we don't need a 100% for the top um, 200 packages. Because in this list is very long, and in the list you have some uh, packages which has been deprecated and replaced by uh, better solutions. And as another very good news is that uh, finally, uh, Python 3 is faster than Python 2. On this uh, picture, you can see that um, on a specific list of benchmarks, the so list of benchmarks where Python 3 is, uh, the difference with Python 3 is the most significant. Uh, so all results are normalized to Python 2, and if a line is, is uh, smaller, it means that it's way faster. 
So you can see that in some cases it's up to two times faster or even or even faster. So there are just two cases where Python Python three is still slower. It's a um, it's a startup time. So there are two benchmarks for the time to start up Python. And this is an issue when you have a very a short um, command line interface. Just run a command and get a result immediately. So, but we are working on these issues. To explain it differently, um, you have to know that the Instagram company is fully based on Python because Instagram is using uh, Django. And um, because of the um, uh, time to market, it's not possible for them to rewrite everything in a different language or just to rewrite everything from scratch uh, because there are too many competitors on this market. So what they, are tr what they did is to port their code base from Python 2 to Python 3. And just by doing that, um, now they, they saved 12% uh, of the CPU and 30% of the memory. And if you think about a very, very large company uh, with Instagram with uh, 700 million users, uh, it costs a lot to, to have um, to, for the server because they, they need a lot, a lot of servers. So any kind of um, optimization um, it means a lot of money for them. If you, if you didn't look at uh, Python 3 changes and uh, you, you are still not convinced the, to move to Python 3, maybe you have to know that we, we have a list of uh, bugs that cannot be fixed in Python 2. Because Python, Python 2 is very old, and because it's very old, we, we know more and more bugs. Uh, but we cannot fix these bugs because of the backward compatibility. Because uh, people consider that Python 2.7 will never change, and they have an expectation on that, that uh, we will not break the be uh, change of behavior. But sometimes to fix bugs, you, you really have to break the backward compatibility. For example, if you think about Unicode, uh, technically, we can, do, we can do a lot of things in Python 2. We, we can break the backward compatibility to make sure that when you compare a byte to a new Unicode, you get an error. But if you do that, um, you can be sure that many users will complain because it will just break uh, all application written in Python 2. Uh, another issue is that uh, for the dictionary type in Python, in Python 2, uh, we are using an hash function because it's an array with an hash function to implement the dictionary. And uh, if you inject specific strings, you, you get the worst case uh, complexity, which means that Python becomes very, very slow. And this is a security issue if you have a web application because an attacker is able to crash your server to abuse your CPU. And we fix the issue in Python 2, but uh, the fix cannot be enabled by default because it changes the, the order of elements in a dictionary. So if you really want to, to make sure that you are secure, you have to opt in for the new fix. To give you another example, uh, the subprocess model uh, to spawn subprocess, um, it is not thread safe. So maybe you did not notice because everything is fine, but maybe one day during the night, you will get this bug and uh, you will add a bad time because uh, it's very difficult to work around this issue. You, you need to put a lock on the function and uh, if you have a big, uh, a big uh, code base, it can uh, take a lot of time to, to fix the issue everywhere. And there are even more complex issues like uh, the recursive lock in Python 2 is not signal safe. So imagine that you spawn uh, a child process. When the child process completes, uh, you get a signal to notify that the child process completes. And this signal, if it comes at the wrong time, make, uh, may, um, can make your recursive lock inconsistent. So you, bad thing will happen and you cannot control when it happens, it's very difficult to reproduce this kind of bug because you don't control the execution time of the child process, so you may get the signal early or late. And last but not least, as the, the clocks in a Python 2 are not monotonic. Um, if you see the previous talk about the, the, the time zone, 
you also see that you have the winter time and uh, summer time in many countries. And even in some countries, you get uh, four changes per year. And because, because of the change, the clock uh, moves in one direction or another by one hour. And uh, in some cases, it can, it can crash your application because the application doesn't understand why the clock is moving backward or forward. And to, to fix this issue, you need a monotonic clock, but we were not able to fix that issue in Python 2. But the good news is that we fixed everything. So just use to Python 3 and you're good. Uh, for example, I added a monotonic clock in 3.3. And um, one more complex change is that uh, file descriptor, uh, it's file descriptor, you, you can imagine it's a, it's a file. By default, in Python 2, when you spawn a child process, you will inherit all open, open files. It means that if you open a list of passwords in the master process, and you spawn a new application, you, you will be able to access the password files, and uh, you, didn't, you may not expect this behavior. And uh, it was very difficult to convince other core developers that it's not a good idea, uh, because uh, this change breaks the backward compatibility, and uh, you may know that we care about a lot about the backward compatibility. In Python 3.7, I made a different change, is that uh, when you get a signal, uh, for example, when a child process completes, when you get a signal uh, and Python is currently blocked in a blocking syscall, so it's, a, for example, you read uh, data on the disk and the disk uh, doesn't have the data in cache, so you have to wait for the hardware. In this case, if you get a signal, the syscall uh, is interrupted. You get an um, it interrupted error. And in this case, uh, you may get an error and you have to handle it in your application. And it's very annoying because you have to, to be prepared for signal at any, any kind of syscall. And uh, there are many, many blocking syscall. So the change is that uh, Python will now retry the syscall for you. So if you are blocking syscall and you get an, a this error, Python will just uh, do the same syscall one more time. And to, to explain you the, the advantage of Python 3 is that um, th this is a quote from Guido van Rossum on my pep about the file descriptors. He wrote that we are aware of the code breakage. This is lucky crows, but doing it anyway for the good of mankind. And um, if you are still stuck at Python 2 you, and you still need reason to move to Python 3, you have to know that in the standard library, we got not less than 21 new modules. And just to name a few, there is a AsyncIO, Enum, Passlib, UnitTest.mock, and many, many others. So it means that you don't have to install them. As they are already part of Python. And it's very useful to, to develop new application. It reduces the number of dependency, and uh, there are some tools, for example, to debug Python, which are very useful. So not only is the, the Python has new features uh, in the standard library, but the Python language itself also evolved. Uh, for example, one popular feature of Python 3.6 is called fString. It's a new way to format string, and in my opinion, it's just the, the best way to format string because it's very, it's very short, it's very obvious, and uh, it's very difficult to make mistakes. Uh, for example, you can um, just name a variable and uh, the variable is replaced by its value, but you can also call a method on an object, like call the title method to convert the first letter to an uppercase. You can even do uh, any kind of Python expression. So you can do a lot of things, and uh, not only you can use it for prints, but also for any kind of, any kind of string. Um, for asynchronous programming, we added a lot of, other, lot of things for Python 3 coroutines. The first change was to add a yield from, which is something to delegate a generator. It means that you have one generator and you pass through all values to a different generators. And uh, the first version of asyncIO used yield from, but 
it was a little bit surprising to use it. So in Python 3.5, we added two new keywords, async uh, to, to mark that one function is asynchronous, and await is a keyword to, to say that, oh, I am waiting for something. And by, by doing that, it's much more um, obvious when you read the sentence in English that it makes sense. Not only you, um, and, uh, about uh, AsyncIO, you also have something called uh, asynchronous generators. So you can now use the yield keywords inside AsyncDef. So th this is, for example, very useful if you think about a database. Uh, you would like to, to provide a generator uh, to iterate on each line of a database, but you don't know if the column is going to use all lines. Because, for example, if you, want, if you have uh, one million of uh, rows, you don't want to send it, send it as, a, as a list because it will use too much memory. But using the yield, you are able to, for example, fetch uh, 10 values and iterate on these values, and after that, fetch 10 more values. So you can implement very efficient uh, strategy for database. And the async for uh, can be used for an asynchronous uh, list comprehension, or you can also use async inside uh, list comprehensions. It's not al only about async IOs, there are other very useful Python 3 features in the law and syntax. Uh, I really like the first one, which is a keyword only. So imagine that you have an existing module, uh, and it's very stable, but you, you need to add something to pass a new argument. But if you add a um, positional argument, maybe uh, a user of your library of, on the old version will, uh, will pass the argument and get an error. So the idea is that using a keyword only, you have to specify the name of the, um, of the parameter to write keyword only equal the value. And um, the, the print statement became a function. So here is an example where you can use keywords, but uh, they are not keyword only, but it gives you an idea of the syntax. And um, I, li I also like the print function because to today you can use it in a lambda function, for example. And it's, I really prefer the new syntax. For the star, previously, you was able to use a star um, a, um, when you define a function to, to write star arguments to get an um, arbitrary number of arguments. But now you can also use when you assign a variable to say, for example, one t uh, star tail, and the tail g and gets uh, the rest of the list, the tail of the list. And, and uh, another thing is that now you can use a star inside a list, but also a double star inside a dictionary to say that you, you update the dictionary with another dictionary, like uh, you concatenate two different dictionaries. And something very trivial, but very, very useful for the readability of your application is that today you can add an underscore in your literal numbers. This is very useful so for the readability because if you get nine zeros or six zeros, uh, it's very difficult to read this number to, to see quickly if it's one million, uh, 10 million, or no, uh, one billion. You can also annotate the type of uh, variable uh, using uh, colon uh, and the name of the type, like x colon int. For the context manager, you can specify multiple context manager on a single line. This is very useful. As I said previously, there is a bytes formatter to, to format a byte string. And uh, something very useful, if you use the NumPy, it's a dot operator, as uh, at operator. It's used for uh, matrix uh, multiplication. Uh, in NumPy, currently the name is uh, NumPy dot dot. Uh, but the issue with numpy does, um, dot dot is uh, the way that you pass arguments. It's more difficult to read uh, the expression. Using an infix operator, it's much more obvious uh, how you write your formula. Okay, so we saw that the Python 3 is much more powerful. We saw that we, we have tooling to, to migrate your code very easily to Python 3. So 
Now the question becomes, is it time to bury Python 2 to just delete it? Uh, the good news is that we already started to remove Python 2. Uh, for example, if you install a recent version of Fedora, Fedora since uh, three years, or if you install the latest version of Ubuntu, like Ubuntu since last year, there is no Python 2 in the base system. This means that you, you install the full system, there is no Python binary, there is no Python 2 binary. But obviously, if you install an, an old application which depends on Python 2, like for example, uh, Mercurial or GIMP, GIMP uh, the um, plugins written in Python, you pull the Python 2 dependency. But at least you are able to, to get um, a base system with everything in pure Python 2. About the timeline for the removal of Python 2 in project, uh, there is a, um, a website called Python Free Statements. It's a timeline of um, 20 or more projects with the first support of Python 3 in the project, the deprecation of Python 2, and the removal of uh, Python 2 support. And uh, you already have Python 3 only applications, which are Django 2 and IPython 6, which are Python 3 only. And um, I think that Python 2 was a big ar achievement for the Python community because uh, Python, Python, uh, Django is a very popular module. It's very complete. It has a lot of features. And if something like uh, Django is able to, to move on to Python 3, it means that any, any of you is able to move to Python 3. And there is also a pythonclock.org, which is a countdown until uh, 2020, the 1st of July, which is the end of life for Python 2. So I'm working for Red Hat, so the question is also about Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, you have to know that even if you use Red Hat 6 or Red Hat 7, you can already get Python, Python 3 using something called Software Collections. It's a new repository, and you can easily uh, install, I think, Python, um, 3.6 for, for Red Hat 7 and Python 3.5 for Red Hat 6. So it's already in the um, available. You, um, and you also get supports. The support is a little bit shorter than the operating system, but it's uh, between three years and five years. And, um, and uh, the very good news is also that in the latest version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, so the version 3.7, we announced that Python 2 is not now deprecated. So if you, know that, if you need a reason to, to motivate your manager, you can say that even Red Hat started to deprecate Python 2. And the very good news is that the next version of the Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, will be Python 3 only, no Python 2. And uh, one open question to finish is that uh, we, we saw that we spent a lot of time on porting all the application. It was very painful for the community. It, it took a lot of time and energy to, to write single code base for both versions. So maybe, maybe we can imagine new uh, approach to, um, to add new features to Python. Uh, for example, if you look at the JavaScript approach, uh, what they did is that um, uh, there are two projects called Babel and Polyfill, and using this project, you are able to use the new version of uh, JavaScript, even on very old uh, browsers. And uh, by doing that, JavaScript is uh, able to evolve very quickly, uh, much more uh, faster than Python. Uh, by evolving, I mean that you can use the new features. You don't have to wait until all browsers around the world move to the latest version of JavaScript. And I suggest you to use to see the talk of uh, Daniel es Espoti uh, at uh, PyCon Italy. Uh, he describes the evolution of or stagnation of programming languages, and he compared the Python to JavaScript. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so, uh, seriously about Python 4. I know that many, many of you are joking about Python 4 and expect that 
Python 4 will be the new Python 3 to break the world again, but uh, I think that everybody understood that uh, Python 3 uh, was not well prepared. And maybe for the next version of Python 4, we will do it uh, very, uh, very differently. I mean, is that uh, my expectation for the Python 4 is that it will, it will be as any release of Python 3, which means that we follow the same depre deprecation process. We don't remove features uh, just for fun. We will not break the uh, compatibility uh, for free. Uh, we will just follow the usual process, which is um, that at least you have one version with a dep deprecation warning. And sometimes you even have a pending deprecation warning, another version with the deprecation warning, and uh, until at the third version you start to remove the function. So um, my expectation is that it will be just as any other really is. Okay, thank you. So we can do maybe one quick question. So there is a question there. Thank you for that talk. I was going to ask a boring question about uh, process IDs and per process module, but I'll switch to a more interesting one. Um, how do you yourself and the rest of the core team, along with the PSF, kind of work to get this kind of through? Because you're all not in the same place, it's not in the same company. How do you decide these maybe contentious type decisions to like go, go a certain way or do a certain thing? How, I'd be interested to know kind of what's the process for getting Python out there, the thing that we all use every day. So your question is about how we take decision in Python yeah. to accept a feature or not? So per JavaScript decision. So I've noticed the ES6 is starting to look a lot like Python with the imports, and Python now with the f-string looks like ES6. So kind of how's that process kind of started to work? Uh, what, what I like in Python is that um, compared to Java, to Java, the Java world, for example, everything is open, uh, open to everyone. Uh, there is a Python uh, IDs mailing list when you can propose IDs to get a first feedback. And uh, once the ID is uh, mature enough, uh, it moves to Python dev, wh where we get a second, dis uh, second discussion. And uh, it seems like anyone is able to propose IDs. And if the ID is good enough, uh, you, you may decide to implement it yourself or find someone else. And I don't think that Python is owned by any companies. Um, I think that it's more a community process, and I, um, I don't recall that one company forced to get one specific issues. And uh, as I said, it's really, for me, it's a uh, power of the Python community to, to be open and not to restrict. Uh, you don't have to subscribe or pay money to propose new, ID, new IDs. And for the, for the, the decision itself, uh, again, it's driven by the community. Uh, maybe. Some of you have heard about a new operator, which is called on equal, the PEP 7572. Uh, seven, uh, it's a new assignment operator. Uh, I think that we got something like uh, one hundred, uh, eight hundred emails about that. So we got a lot, a lot of uh, discussion, and um, this is an example where the community uh, stand up to say that. I don't like this feature, and we don't want to, to get it. So I think that the process works pretty well. And um, another aspect of the decision is also that uh, we have the BDFL in Python with uh, Guido Van Rossum. And uh, we also have a, a very strict uh, rules about the consistency of the language. And I think that the, one of the key, f key uh, uh, responsibility of um, Guido is to make sure that the, uh, the world language remains consistent. So we, we, if it's not Pythonic, it will not go in into Python. Okay, thank you everyone. So a last round of applause for Victor. Thank you.